<laughs> but yeah, I'll just get started on the first uh, bullet point. So yeah, we just went through the EIP um, overhaul process. What that entails is uh, putting together a new EIP one. Uh, so that um, so that is already in place. Uh, what right now we have it so that you have to go to the issues if you want to discuss your EIP. And then uh, once it's kind of formalized and you got everything fleshed out and get some you know community feedback. Uh, you go to, uh, there we go. Okay. I'm here. All right. So yeah, Greg, I'm talking about the new EIP process. Um, okay. So yeah, right. you go you go from a uh, issue to a, a PR, and with that PR, we have a new set of, um, or actually, I guess a refined set of uh, template to use on that. We're going to be clearing out all issues. So. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of in process. Uh, all the other information's on there. Uh, if you have an EIP, please go to your EIP and convert it to a PR, uh, or close out the issue, whichever one um, applies to you. So it's uh, a PR already. Awesome. It's been a PR for a month or so. Yeah, so what we're going to do is slowly work through those, uh, either in the all core dev meetings or using the signaling systems we're building. Okay. We should probably, uh, I think it would be a good idea for you to sit on the story. review meeting. So, just so that I understand this right, so it is basically similar to now, just that at some point we will move it to an actual, like, proper pull request. Exactly. And there's a newer template on there that makes it a little bit easier to digest. And with the pull request, if you want to update an EIP, it makes it easier to go through that process of uh, keeping history of the EIP. And is there also a, a template for the issues? Uh, so the, for the issues, you can just you can use the PR template if you want. A lot of people just go in and say, I have an idea. So it's it's very unstructured. All the issue section is now is a place for people to go and talk about the EIPs and they can use the PR template or not. So it's not an ink until it's uh, an accepted pull request is the important thing. And who is then merging them? Uh, there's a group of eight editors. Um, myself, Nick, Casey, uh, Dietrio, Gav, Roman, Vitalik, uh, and I believe there might be Greg as well. I'm uh, Yeah, and then there's like one or two others, but um, I think maybe Christian. So, yeah, the, the editors go through, and once uh, consensus is met, we will merge it. Right now, there's kind of a backlog, so it's going to be a little bit slow at first, but we're working on the uh, Ethereum package manager, just because that was already mostly written up by Piper. So that's going to go in uh, very soon as an official E. And then uh, Robert, you just uh, joined us. Uh, yes. Hello. Awesome. Hey, uh, nice to meet you. And you're, you're I guess, going to represent Parity and Ethcore? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, I guess so. Cool. So yeah, how these meetings go down, we just uh, go through the agenda, which I will paste to you in GitHub, or sorry, Gitter. And uh, we kind of try to come to consensus amongst our different development groups about what uh, changes are going to happen in the future, just kind of have a sync up. So uh, any comments you can provide would be great, and uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for that. And if you have an agenda item at the end, feel free to let us know, and we can tag it on. Okay, sure thing. Great. So that was the first item. Uh, the second one is going to be Christian talking about ZK Snark precompile. So. I believe that there might have been some finality on that. So, Christian, um, if you want to go ahead. Thanks. So, um, I did not convert the issue to a pull request yet, but I updated the issue description to the uh, pull request template. Um, the main changes or, yeah, yeah, the main change between the last version were that addresses are fixed to, oh, sorry, I clicked on the link and it brought me to the 
Right. Okay. It's basically it's two it's two um, EIPs, and the first one is one nine six, which is uh, additional scalar multiplication, and then one nine seven, I guess, which is the the pairing function. Um, right. Okay. It's two agenda items. They are just incorrectly linked. Okay. Then let's talk about CK Snark uh, pairings first. Um, so that's one nine seven. Um, I think the specification did not actually change. Uh, after a suggestion from Vitalik, I simplified the, the actual mathematical specification, but uh, the semantics did not change. Uh, I assigned the address of, of eight to the precompile. Um, we settled on uh, two dimensional coordinates for the um, for the curve points and I think that's it so what still needs to be determined is the uh, the gas costs and that's I guess uh, a topic after some of the implementations are finished are there any comments Yeah, I was wondering a bit about, uh, I don't know the full uh, mathematical details, but regarding the gas cost, is this, uh, are these methods easy to, um, uh, to have one type of, to, to estimate the gas uh, and processing based on the input? Or does it vary widely? You mean depending on the actual inputs? Yes. Um, I guess, I mean, it's elliptic curve points. So I think we can just try random, random coordinates or something like this. I don't think that it will differ a lot. So there's what no we reason. Can do, so the, the number of points is a factor that, that um, influences the runtime. I'm fine with actually limiting the number of, of inputs to something like 10, perhaps, if we can't find a good uh, asymptotic for that. Yeah, but I think it should be linear in the number of points, so that's, that's not a big thing. And, and what did you say about uh, wondering about the mathematical specification? What did you mean by that? No, I didn't mean it. I just meant that I didn't um, that I didn't know much about it. That was just it. That was the basis of my question. I didn't know if the complexity could be estimated based on inputs or if it was uh, hidden worst worst cases in there, which you wouldn't then, you know, detect statically. So I think Vitalik knows more details about that, but. I think once you fix the curve, then the complexity is more or less fixed because you have this, so the main, the main computational unit you have is this Miller loop and the number of iterations there is, is bounded depending on the actual curve you use. Okay, so it sounds like, is there any, if there's not any other comments on that, uh, it sounds like this is going to go into the process of formalization now. Um, there shouldn't be much of an issue with consensus, but we might check um, outside of an all core dev meeting uh, just for the final, you know, just kind of getting the thumbs up from most people about that. Does that sound good, Christian? Yep. So concerning formalization, so you mean converting it into latte? <laughs> oh, that. I was actually talking about the PR, but um, on the topic of the yellow paper, that will need to be something we work out because there's a lot of open pull request in there. And uh, right now, I know Yoichi has been uh, working to kind of clean that up, but there's also things that are not updated from Spurious Dragon. So it's kind of a question of uh, do we update the yellow paper? Who needs to update it, and that and that kind of thing. But until then, I guess we would be using the EIPs as our more or less our 
Beck until the yellow paper is updated. By the way, do we have pre-compiled contracts in the yellow paper? Are they specified there? Yes, they're specified at least the first five of them. I don't know about the newer ones. OK. Great. So yeah, uh, that part is complete. Uh, let's see. All right. So um, yeah, that's for both item two and three. The uh, ZK Snart precompiles. Uh, this next one is Metropolis. So what I'm going to do is so Vitalik signing on in the next couple minutes. Uh, Hudson, um, yep. I thought we. I thought the the uh, elliptic curve operations were a different item. Oh, you're right. I was grouping them together. I need more sleep. Uh, yeah, go ahead and go uh, go on with that, Christian. <laughs> so I'm not sure. If, so yeah, I'm not sure if much has to be said here. Yeah, I mean the encoding is basically the same. The encoding of curve points. Yeah, I think yeah. that got resolved last meeting. We were just going to get like a final kind of thing from parity team. And I think uh, Arkady joined. Uh, can you hear us, Arkady? Yep, I'm here. Awesome, welcome. OK, so. Um, so here, multiplication is a bit more complicated with regards to gas costs. But I guess it can be dealt in a very similar way to, um, to exponentiation. So that should not be a big problem. Yes, what is the, the progress in, in implementations there? I've seen that Go Ethereum started. Yep. Yeah, I started an implementation. I didn't I didn't get much further than just the field elements, but Okay. And for, for parity is the plan to just use an external library? Mm, for what exactly? You see a plan? Yeah, elliptic curve operations and and yeah, also uh, pairing. Yeah, we'll just use library. There is a number to choose from. We'll just pick okay. something. Good. Okay, I think we can conclude these two items. Okay, great. Um, and then Martin uh, in chat talked about how one of the um, items is now. Uh, it went from like 140 to 196, I think. Um, the uh, EIP numbers are generally going to stay the same as the issue number, um, unless uh, the author wants to do it otherwise. So it kind of goes into flux. So if, if there's a weird PR number, just look for the reference to the issue number. So yeah, uh, next on the agenda is city metropolis so this is a big one um so vitalik's going to join soon and facilitate a lot of this uh christian until vitalik gets here um if you could just kind of lead this and nick to uh oh damn all right uh hudson's cut out uh is Anyone else still here? Is it just Hudson? I'm here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's uh, basically just him wins. So I'm sorry. I, I just question. Um, question about 196. Um, I, I'm I'm fully aware that we probably want to do 197. Um, when did we discuss 196? I don't remember this from any of the previous calls that we've had. Oh yeah, I thought we discussed one and six also in the in the previous call. Perhaps you you more or less combined it with one one and seven. Uh, the thing is that that for zk zk snarks you also need elliptic curve multiplication of points. Otherwise, it's not efficient enough. All right. And it's yeah, it's basically the same operations on the same curve. I mean, when you when you implement the um, when you implement the pairing function, you also need that anyway, I guess. It's just oh, okay, another cool. point. Okay. All right, all right, cool, yeah. All right, so these these methods, are you will need them anyway for the pairing, good. Okay. Yes, yeah. All right. Okay. And it's also on the same curve, so. Right, cool. Okay, thanks.
So, Nick, do you want to take over? Yes. Uh, shall we press on to the next item? Which was, so we just covered Electric Curve Edition, uh, Metropolis and Associated Eats. Uh, I guess, uh, is Christian here? Because Vitalik isn't. So we don't have either of our facilitators. Yeah, yeah so I'm here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, in that case, do you want to take this away? Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, so, EP58. Um, between the last meeting and, and this meeting, we noticed that, uh, so yeah, everyone is aware of the, the proposal A and proposal B, where proposal A says um, charge memory enlargement for return value to the caller, where proposal B is charge memory enlargement uh, to the callee, to the remaining gas of the callee. And we noticed that this uh, might break existing contracts when they call into the, um, the identity precompile because uh, the gas costs for the identity precompile are quite easy to calculate and thus Solidity generates code or generated code um, where the, the, the amount of gas was, was exactly specified. And if we now change it to um, make the, the callee pay for enlarging the memory, then there won't be enough gas to do that. So um, basically the, the, the compromise uh, proposal was to keep the old semantics uh, unless the size of the return area specified has a special value, which could be two to the 256 minus one or two to the 64 minus one or something like that. And only in that case, um, apply these special rules where memory is enlarged twice and the enlargement for the return value uh, is charged to the callee. What are the opinions on that proposal? What's, what's the advantage of, of all of this over just charging the um, callee the whole time? Uh, sorry, the caller the whole time. The advantage is that the, the caller does not know in advance how large the return value will be. But point. they they specified an upper bound, didn't they? Ah, sorry. So you, what you just said was basically proposal A, is that correct? Effectively, yeah. I, well, ah, okay. things like B is getting more complicated. So, so the, the advantage of proposal B over proposal A is that um, you know for a fact whether the call opcode will fail or not before you execute the, the, the actual call. And I mean, in a way, this also kind of protects the caller um, because if the, if the caller does not specify an effective upper bound, so just a gigantic value, then the callee can make the outer call fail by making it go out of gas. Uh but then isn't that easily solved if the caller just specifies a maximum gas that is below, oh, sorry, a maximum memory that won't consume uh, all of their gas? That is hard to come up with. True, because it's quadratic. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, it, it, getting into all sorts of each cases with sometimes charged to caller and sometimes charged to callee and so on for B seems a, a real problem though. Why? Because it significantly complicates the, the PM and the proposal and introduces more, more potential for errors. It makes it harder to reason about basically. Sure, I mean, <laughs> um... Yeah, the, the proper way to do this would to would be to provide a uh, return, something like something like call data, but for, for return data. But I think we're past that. So the only way to fix this is is one of these problem these, these methods, I guess. Well, could we not do that actually? I mean, if we just said that return data always gives you you know return data and return data then let you access all the return data. 
and the amount of memory you provide in the call op code, it'll fill up to that much. Then new code could simply set that to zero all the time and use return data. Yeah, I mean, so you mean just like call data len and call data copy add opcodes yes. for return data len and return data copy. Yes, and the, the call op code would remain would continue to function the same way as previously, except that you could also fetch return data through those op new opcodes. And if return area is too small to, so yeah, basically. It writes whatever it can up to the limit of the return yeah. area, and then that's it. Mm. And it would avoid this, uh, you know, the, the memory accounting issue to the same degree. What is the model for eWASM in that area? Someone from eWASM here? Uh, Greg? I'm not an eWASM person. Oh, I thought you were for some reason. I, keep, I do keep an eye on it. Could you state the question more precisely? I might be able to answer it. How is the interface for function calls in, in eWASM? How do you pass uh, input data and how do you, do you retrieve return data? I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, no, I'm not really sure. Okay. Well, is, where's Martin? He's not here. Oh, okay. Once, once it gets, you know, into the EVM, it looks the same. But how they make that happen, I'm not sure. Hello, Vitalik. Hi, everyone. Sorry if I'm late. Uh, no worries. We were just discussing uh, eight. Uh, eight. OK. Yet another proposal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, I, I think, I think um, we need to have yet another proposal for this one, and we move on to, to the next E while we further discuss 5A slash X. Perhaps yeah. some opinion from Vitalik. Um, hold on. So why do we need a new proposal? So the, the uh, new proposal would be to add uh, basically return size and return copy in a similar way as we have call data and call data copy. The reasoning being that um, accounting for return values has turned out to be more complicated than expected with the current proposal. Hold on. So what would be a return? Ret on, uh, so, so what would the return size and return copy opcodes do? Uh, so return size would tell you the total amount of data that the most recently called contract tried to return, and return data copy would copy the specified segment of that into the specified segment of memory, and the call op code would continue to operate as as it does already. So if you were writing new code that expected a variable return size, you'd just say return size zero or whatever suits, and then get data through the new op codes. Okay, this just sounds like way over complicated to me. Uh, check out the recent discussion on five about um, gas okay. accounting, because that also okay. turns out to be more complicated. <laughs> um, issue issue five. Or? Yes, sorry, issue eight. Oh, but issue five. Oh, in, issue the, eight. Okay. in the notes is five slash eight. Okay. Well, what 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 Nick's proposing seems quite doesn't seem to be so complicated. Let's. I. Uh, I think Christian's right. We should take this offline um, and and discuss it amongst those of us interested in in it, rather than try and resolve it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that brings us to eighty six uh, proposed initial abstraction changes for Metropolis. Uh, yes. Do you want to take that, Vitalik? Um. Yes. Um, so the uh, basic idea, I think, as well, I think we've probably already mentioned in calls a few times, is that we allow a new type of transaction where if the signature is equal to zero, 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 then that transaction gets treated as valid and the center address is assumed to be 2 to the 160 minus 1, which is like 0x FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
a like in realistic use cases a forwarding contract which would basically check this the transaction data for a signature and if everything passes then it would uh, either uh, pass the message along or in some cases do something uh, do other things and uh, i mean this has a few goals one of those goals is to kind of do abstract away account security one of them is to abstract away yeah, at least partially abstract away nonces um, a third one is to allow contracts to pay for gas. So in order for this to work well, there are kind of three things, or as we discovered in the uh, thread, four things that would needs to be eventually done in parallel. So two of them are items two and three in the EIP, and, which, and what they do is they basically switch the, the way that uh, contract addresses are determined from being based on sender and nonce uh, to being based on uh, the uh, code and uh, and the sender. And the purpose is basically so that you can sense to accounts before those accounts exist, and because that's like what you can do with any regular Ethereum address. So, and the idea would be that you would calculate yourself what the uh, address would be you would, uh, with that particular piece of code, and people could send Ether to it or do whatever, or send whatever other tokens to it. And whenever you want to, and if start using that account, you can by uh, basically creating, sending a contract creation transaction, which creates that particular account. And the only kind of the only account that you can create at that particular address is an account that has that exact same piece of code. Now, for backwards compatibility purposes, um, I, like this was uh, debated in uh, previous discussion and like previous calls, and people seemed most in favor of basically creating a new op code, which can be, I mean, I use create P2SH, but you can rename it to like create what, um, like create uh, with code address or whatever. And that would basically apply the same principle to uh, contract creation transactions. Now there's, in order for this, uh, so that's in protocol, then there's also extra protocol stuff. The nice thing about the extra protocol stuff is that it like it's not critical, it's not consensus. And it's not critical path, and so we can theoretically implement it like a month or two after the hard fork, and that'll be fine. And that basically is logic in the miner and logic in any node that does transaction propagation that would basically scan for a specific type, like, like, like come up with a set of rules that say if this transaction passes at least one of these rules, then it can be either it can be propagated or it can be included. And like the rules, one simple rule as was described in the uh, comments would be to check for a regexp that would basically say this account, uh, this uh, transaction goes to a particular type of account which is guaranteed to pay uh, at least some fee to the miner. Yeah, that's the, the, the latter sound definitely reasonable. Um, I've, I've already partially implemented this change in Go. Um, apart from the mining strategies and uh, transaction relaying strategy. So, so uh, I have a question, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. how, you, how exactly you protect, uh, you know, uh, attackers from uh, kill all the budget of this contract? Just... Attackers, attackers from doing what with the contract, sorry? Just, just trying to spend all the money that are there for, you know, or paying for good transaction, just send transactions and ah, okay. So one important there. point is that the uh, con the contract only pays gas after it determines that it uh, the the signature is valid. So if you just send it junk data, then it's just not going to do anything. And yeah, but the signature is all, all zero, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so I, I no no no, I, it's I, it's the it's the signature provided through the call data. So it's not the signature on the transaction itself. So you would pass in, um, so the transaction data would, would contain the actual signature and you validate the signature within the contract itself. That's basically the idea. But basically you could still then uh, spam the network of invalid uh, transactions and invalid signatures, right? So yes, because but, the miner would would be... start, but you would have to start process already. At least like, well, yeah. So the idea is that no miner would be stupid enough to include transactions that don't pay them. And like that, and by default, like until we start implementing strategies, miners are not gonna mine any of these transactions anyway. I mean, yeah. to be clear, at present, you could, attackers can make uh, nodes do work 
by validating the signature of the transaction. So I think the idea is that the cost of validating one of these would be roughly on par with the current signature validation. It's just that now yeah. it can be user specified. But in this case, they would have to spin up the EVM first to like execute this contract. The contract will stop at this point, throw, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. So we might have to increase the transaction fee proportionally. Although, no, that doesn't really help. <laughs> Currently, if, if, the, if the regular expression is strict enough, uh, we don't actually have to run the EVM. We can also just do a, yeah, basically what we do with precompose. But it's yeah, so you do a fast path, effectively, and say, oh, I know what that contract does. I'll compute it myself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, sorry, I, I still miss it. Like, what is the, the basic principle that we use? to identify uh, addresses that we should uh, pay for them and addresses that we are not going to pay for them. What do you mean? Like, you, you get a transaction, right? You identify it was sent by some address, and uh, now you know that you have to pay all for that or, or you don't have to pay for that. So OK, hold on. So who, who, is, who is you? Are you a miner, are you a sender, or are you a receiver? Yeah, you are a miner. You are a miner, and, and you okay. should understand okay. if it's a valid transaction. Okay, you're a miner. You receive an EIP-86 transaction, and that EIP-86 transaction has some two address, right? So okay. what you would do is you would basically run a regex on the code of the two address, and you would determine whether or not it matches like one particular preset pattern that would determine that it's kind of safe and that, it's, uh, and that, that, that transaction is actually going to pay you a particular fee. So you also have to check the balance of that contract, right? Yes. So you have to check the balance of that contract against the max gas that is also specified as part of the I don't think you data. necessarily yes. have to do that if you're sure that it will execute quickly and give you an answer, because it might be quicker just to ask the contract. Mm. Oh, so sorry. So uh, if, if I'm now in the head of the facilitator of this uh, type of contract, I, I should mm. specify a regex for all contracts, sorry, for all addresses I'm going to pay for? Uh, no, no, no. So the regexp is a rule, is a minor strategy rule, right? So the idea is that would be like at some point after the fork, you would release a version of the, uh, like, or anyone who runs a, uh, a client that gets used for mine by miners would add in a, like at least one or two regexps that would, uh, and these would basically identify, you know, pieces of code that are kind of okay for the, or likely to be profitable for the miner to include. And I cannot, uh, you know, I cannot fake this regex if I'm um, the, the attacker. If I'm the attacker and I want to uh, take advantage of some budget that is saved there for some addresses to be paid, I cannot, uh, you know, fake the trade. Or, or imitate the right regex to be paid for? Uh, no. Um, no, so the regex would be strict enough such that you can prove that any code that matches it would be code that basically if if that if the account has enough money to pay for it and if the sig and if the signature is valid, then the uh, transact the transaction would actually take money out of that account and give that money to the miner. Oh, sorry, one more question. So we are talking about regex of the code inside mm -hmm. the smart contract? Of the code inside the, uh, of the code of the two address. So, but, but the regular expression itself is stored in the code of the client. Yes. And it can only be changed with a software upgrade, basically. Or it will yeah. only be changed. Hmm. So I, I have, uh, you know, uh, some sort of proposition uh, to maybe uh, add to this CIP and tell, tell me if it's reasonable. Uh, uh, for example, addresses that are not identified by, by this regex, but they are, uh, I, they, they have a value. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to attack with them, uh, you know, if the value is large enough. Uh, so maybe these addresses can be also passed into the contract. Um, uh, and you know it can be valuable in some uh, very famous cases. So, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that once EIP eighty six is implemented, like we can we can definitely keep on coming up with more and more regex that capture more and more classes of contracts that are safe for miners to include, and miners are going to are free to kind of add new regex unilaterally, and uh, oh. you know they. 
Sorry. So it's not just on the address code, it's on any field of the transaction? OK, so basically, <clears throat> The so the reg so the reg so the rule that a miner would use to determine whether or not it includes a transaction is a, is a function that takes the following inputs. One input is the code of the of the contract uh, of the two address. Another input is the balance of the two address to make sure it has enough money, and the third input is the data of the transaction. And the reason it needs the data of the transaction is so that it can tell whether or not the fee is high enough and whether or not the signature is valid. Now, theoretically, of course, you could you could have like these rules could potentially be like arbitrary, um, quickly computable functions on those three pieces of data. Well, sounds interesting. Um, okay, I, I guess uh, we we should uh, you know make this uh, comment thread on the CIP more active. I, I guess these questions are. Uh, it's it's still a little bit uh, you know shaky for me, but uh, uh, it's it just in details. I don't want to take all the time of everybody, so yeah, I will pass on. Um, but, you know, if you ask questions on the on on the thread, uh, just take a look there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay then. Mm -hmm. Perhaps one thing thing to discuss here is. Um, is it a good strategy to test this? Um, how test would we test strategy? it? Yeah, that's my question. Um, <laughs> do we uh, necessarily? Uh, hmm. As we do usually, we just implement this and, and wait somebody is going to attack it. Well, no, because <laughs> well, it, it, the um, important thing is right that like when the EIP when the hard fork is implemented, initially none of these regex are going to be implemented, right? So initially, the only um, like basically okay, theoretically, a malicious miner could include one of these transactions, but it would just go be processed according to the consensus rules, and uh, we use the same like the same state test methodology that we've used for for two years. And it shouldn't really be a big issue, right? Like it's basically just a fairly small extension to the signature scheme. The so uh, anyone, nobody would rel relay these transactions anyway. And like Fatalik said, if yeah. somebody include, if a miner includes these transactions, then so be it. Yeah. Now, I mean, in terms of actually testing these expressions, one thing that we could do later on is that what once the uh, EIP is uh, in, at least implemented. I mean, once the, the fork is done on the testnet and on the mainnet, then on the testnet we can probably start um, letting some clients uh, kind of turn some of these rag apps exps on, and uh, and but that'll be a a separate process. So it's important to know that these rag apps, um are also being used for relaying and not just for you know, not just as a mining strategy. Yes. So it's, it, what I'm trying to say is it will be hard to attack, especially when we just roll out this this hard point. Yeah. Yeah, so like the in, in general, right, the the kinds of attack classes we have to worry about are basically one can, like one of them is consensus failure and this is fairly simple from a consensus standpoint. The other one is uh, um like network propagation and uh, various kinds of transaction DOSs. And at least initially, there aren't going to be in, be any regexps. And so there's not going to be transaction propagation issues. And we'll be able to kind of loosen that over time on whatever schedule is necessary. So you know, apart from um, relaying and mining strategy, can we say that this proposal has been accepted? Accepted as in, first of all, that we would like to have it in, in a hard fork, and second, do we want to have it in Metropolis? I think it's reasonable to call it accepted. Um, mm -hmm. I, I defer to others whether we can include it in Metropolis. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I'd say, 
I mean, I'd personally say this is uh, one of the probably one of the higher. My preference would be to try to uh, put it into into Metropolis, and I mean, one of the reasons why I say this is just because of uh, complementarity with uh, the uh, zk Stark applications, um, but uh, and alongside. It's also one that just has a fairly kind of high trade-off of uh, value to uh, implementation cost, but that's. You know. Look, I, I mean, personally, I would I would much rather like if we have to start putting things on the chopping block, I'd much rather purge things uh, things like the revert opcode. But that's my personal opinion. Are there any objections from from dev team leads or, or members to implementing this in time for Metropolis? What is in time for Metropolis? I wasn't aware we had a concrete date. Well, give it, 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 let me say, uh, are there any objections to implementing it in the next fork from, pe from the people who are in charge of, of figuring out what their teams can do? And in the absence of that, I think it would be fair to say that this is tentatively on the next fork. Mm -hmm. Does anyone agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I guess this needs to be put in a pull request now, so yes. that we can actually accept it. Yes. And merge. I will do that. Okay. okay. Uh, next one was. Where are we? Uh, sorry. Um, I still have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, how does eighty six work with CIP one five five? The replay. Protection, repair attack protection. Um, so is the question like, will EIP eighty six transactions be replay protected? Like the two are kind yeah. of mutually exclusive with each other. Um, I'm inclined to say that by default, I don't see. Uh, I don't see any risks. Um, well, actually, by default, there's not going to be risks because like the. Uh, other blockchains aren't going to, or like the other Ethereum instantiations aren't going to immediately implement this. I mean, the one thing that we could bring in is the uh, chain ID parameterization. So, so like, if we want, to I actually assume that we that we actually put the chain ID into the V, and that V being zero okay. would be after um, after having derived the chain ID. Okay. Um, in that case, that's yeah, that's fair. So we could. Uh, Basically, instead of making it be zero zero zero, it would be a, just be like a, either chain ID chain ID zero zero or chain ID times two zero zero. That seems like trivial enough, and I can just put that into the PR. So, uh, and to be clear, uh, intra-chain replay attacks are the responsibility of the, the verification function. Correct. So that's that's something perhaps that should be uh, talked a bit more about in the issue. So. I mean, with, with that abstraction, we can't have an ordering of, uh, of transaction anymore because if, I mean, the contract can check the nonce, but then the transaction will be executed. It just won't have any effect, but it will consume gas. So mm -hmm. you can't basically, you can't put out a queue of transactions that will be then uh, executed in order, which is probably also a good thing because it consumes resources in the, in the miners and clients that aren't paid for. Right, right. Well, I mean, that that sounds that sounds highly dependent on miner strategy. Is like it, you could potentially have a, like miners have a regex that checks for a specific type of account that has a non scheme, in which case you can keep an order, or you could have a regex for some different non scheme that might not require an order, or you might have a regex for, for some UTXO scheme. So. It's like it's in the longer term. It seems situation dependent. Sure, but but any miner can include uh, transactions with a future nonce, and that ah, will yes. be accepted Correct. by all clients. Yeah. Correct. So, like from the from the point of view of kind of relaying information about the effect of transactions, the two new things would be that number one, theoretically, a transaction can be included uh, can be included twice, and. Uh, and so you'd have to look at, I mean, like this basically you'd have to look at a, you have to, you'd have to make sure that the transaction emitted a log if you wanted to check that it actually did something. All oh, right, but that's something I actually even didn't consider. So, 
by just taking an old transaction, you can rob anyone. Is that correct? No, no, you can't rob anyone. Why not? <laughs> um, because if uh, like there, there is still going to be like any of any sane actor is still going to have some kind of non scheme or some or some alternative inside of their contract. Sure, right? but even if you have a non scheme, you have to pay for the gas that checks the non. Ah, but the ah, uh, but the transaction is not going to. Pay. The transaction or the account code is not going to pay for the gas until the nonce is correct. So if a miner includes it, then the miner is not going to be paid anything. The gas price will be zero. Ah, right. So the right. assumptions so, that are there in your code will will break early and don't pay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, um, sorry to interrupt. I need to leave now. Um, Peter and Nick okay. are both on the call, so they'll further represent the go team. Mm -hmm. All right. See you. See you. See you. Uh, so, can we move on to 96, uh, putting block hashes and state routes into the state? Yes. All right, you'll um, take that again, Vic. Yeah. So, uh, basically, the reason why I, uh, I keep, well, there's two reasons why I came up with this. One reason is as a uh, Part, uh, as part of kind of abstracting and simplifying the, the, the protocol, I wanted to move to like basically move to away from having any kind of implicit state except for state that's like actually reflected in part of the state root. So that the state transition function actually is, you know, take a state, add a transaction, and get a new state without also having like some other state that we don't actually call the state. And Right now, the last 256 block hashes, in some sense, are kind of part of this phantom state. And this ends up like actually increasing implementation complexity. Um, and it also it, it's also kind of limited because of, uh, it's uh, there are use cases for checking block hashes way further back than 256 blocks, but if we were to, if we were to try and stretch it that much further back, then it would require even more infrastructure in order to be able to actually fetch these hashes quickly enough. So the intention here basically is that we would store some number of block hashes in the state, and the block hash opcode would be a kind of redirected to read this and basically look at what the what the contract says, and at the same time the the contract that stores these uh, state these state routes or sorry these block hashes would also have a function. So the goal would be that we would try and like nudge people to work to use this function to access the yeah, block hashes instead of using the block the block hash opcode. The second part of this is that we'd make state routes accessible uh, based just as block hashes are. The uh, thinking here basically is that um, this would uh, allow um, like it's it's more it's more intended as a as a kind of as a longer term feature in order to allow a th in order for things like uh, Casper or Casper or future changes to the consensus algorithm be uh, more capable of kind of evaluating things from inside of the EVM. But it's also something like some applications might uh, dis decide that they could benefit from, and it's fairly uh, relatively easy to implement. So the idea is that this, basically there would be a parallel mechanism that does the exact same thing in the state routes as is already done with block hashes. If nothing else, it allows contracts to very easily process proofs of previous states. Right. Um, uh, sorry. And the other main important benefit here is for light clients. So right now, basic. Uh, <laughs> Basically, in order for a light client to like actually properly be uh, have full, the full light client security, it technically still has to validate the entire chain. But because with this mechanism, you would have an automatic uh, kind of mechanism by which blocks would points to block would directly points to blocks that are like fifty thousand blocks before them. This would allow light clients to kind of verify a partial chain that skip that kind of skips ten thousand blocks at a time. And you'd basically be able to have like, like potentially even higher syncing efficiency than the existing guest light clients, and at the at the same time, kind of base the full the full chain's worth of proof of work security without checkpoints.
Uh, yes, so one question. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a plan to uh, eventually extend this contract to store uh, all state routes or all block hashes? Okay, so this uh, gets a bit more uh, more intricate. Um, so there's a bit of a trade-off here because like, you could potentially store every state route and every block hash, and that would actually technically be the easiest thing to code, but that would also lead to like a lot of state growth. So in a block for, or sorry, in a year right now, for example, there are going to be at least uh, t or about 2.2 million blocks. 2.2 million blocks times 32 bytes uh, gets you to about uh, 70 megabytes. And then that times, times an overhead factor of two. And then that times another two for block hashes and state routes would get you to 280 megabytes of state growth a year. So that's like, it's a bit overkill. Now, if we want to go back further, then I actually did, I, I, this hasn't been updated yet, but I do have a mechanism which kind of does it much better. And the idea basically is that you would uh, store the last uh, two, you would have one mechanism that stores the last 256 blocks. Then you would have enough, another mechanism that stores the last uh, 615, the, every 256 block for the last 256 blocks. And then you would have a mechanism that stores every 256 square block for the last up to 256 cubed and so forth. So the idea would be that you would kind of have several copies of the same mechanism, except they would have kind of different levels of frequency and uh, different, uh, at, at the same time, go further back. So, like block ha individual block hashes would only be accessible within f within a fairly short frame. But if you're willing to restrict yourself to block numbers that are a specific multiple, then you could go back go back much further. So, the uh, it, it's theoretically it's actually not that much more difficult to code up. Um, the uh, But you know, but this would actually allow you to kind of basically hop from any block to any other block in the blockchain in logarithmic time. Hmm, I see. Okay, uh, but that's uh, not the plan for now. Right. I mean, like if uh, if needed, I could I, I could always just write up in in a in EIP for that, just so that people can see kind of how easy or how complex it is. Well, actually, from an EIP standpoint, the two are, are equal in complexity because the goal, what, the goal would be that uh, from the point of view of consensus code, what you would actually be doing is you would be doing a call to a contract, and it would be contract code that's running the logic, and the contract's code would only be needed would only need to be written once. Okay, and then I have uh, one more question, which was. Um, uh, you spoke about like a very fast sort of initial sync mechanism where we mm -hmm. would be able to just uh, go backwards very quickly by skipping the whole batch that's included yeah. in the storage. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're if we're starting from some header which is uh, entirely disconnected from the genesis, then an attacker could just put in fake block hashes and fake state roots. Uh, we still have to walk backwards and verify the the proof of work for all of those individual blocks. To the genesis. Uh, right, right, no, sorry. So for, for actually, so for this to work well, basically you would actually need to have a somewhat different rule. You would need to have a block point to its uh, ants points directly to ancestors that satisf that just in accidentally end up satisfying a much higher proof of work threshold. The idea would be that the probabilistic chain would end up being kind of being almost as hard to falsify as or almost as hard to kind of make a, a a fake copy of as uh, creating an entire fake chain. Right, so because like if you imagine, a, if, if you see a block where that block satisfies a difficulty threshold a thousand times higher than normal just by random chance, then from a proof of, from a proof of work standpoint, it's worth a thousand times as much as a regular block. So the goal would be that you would kind of try and find a chain containing all of the high, all of the kind of high, uh, high difficulty blocks, and you would use that as kind of probabilistic proof to show, you know, this is the chain, this is a chain that actually had a lot of people doing stuff on it. Uh, interesting. So it's sort of we find the keystone blocks that occur by coincidence. 
Exactly, yeah. Okay, yes, that sounds pretty reasonable. Yeah. Like the, yeah, the way that I'd even see it is uh, I think you might only need to make, to prove the correctness of like maybe 10 or 20 keystone blocks. So just basically the algorithm on the server side would be step one, scan through the entire chain. Step two, find the 10 or 20 blocks that satisfy a, a difficulty threshold 100 times, 100,000 times higher than normal. Then step three, use this uh, kind of bl block hash linking mechanism to prove a hash link path from each one, each one of these super blocks to the previous. And then you would just and ship it off as a proof to a light client. And the whole thing would be maybe like five or 10 kilobytes long. And the light, or well, I mean, fine, maybe like 10 to, 10 to 50 kilobytes. And the light client would be able to just kind of blaze through it probably in a few seconds. Is there a need for that proposal? Um, it's I can I mean I I haven't written it up so far because it's not consensus or at least like it's it's not baseful no consensus but I can also assign myself the task of doing that. Okay. Uh, shall we move on to the next one on the agenda, which is E one hundred uh, change difficulty adjustment to target mean block time, including uncles? Yes. Um, so this was originally posted by uh, or a response to a bug that was uh, uncovered by Sergio Lerner, which is basically the uncle mining uh, incentive issue. And the idea here is that because right now the block time targets one unit of, of height growth per 14.3 seconds, it's uh, like a, theoretically a malicious cartel of miners that wanted to maximize its own revenue would actually have the incentive to make three blocks at every height level and uh, and that way instead of earning and, and then just include each other as uncles and that way instead of earning five ether per 14.3 seconds as normal it would end up earning something like 14 ether every three seconds and now that that's the case if you have a perfect cartel but if you have even a single mine or a single mining pool that has more than about 20 percent of this of uh, hash power then you actually have incentives to do a kind of weaker version of the strategy to increase revenue. So I mean, the uh, solution here basically is that to make a tweak to the uh, block, uh, to the difficulty adjustment rule so that in, 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 instead of targeting one uh, block height increase per 14.3 seconds, it basically instead it ends up targeting one block header per some, uh, about 13 seconds, you know, including uncles. Um, now, there's a difference between version 1A and version 1B. And version 1B basically treats blocks with one uncle and blocks with two uncles as being the same thing. And even though this, te this technically does so slightly weaken incentive compatibility, but like even still you get like about maybe 70%, 75% of the benefit. But the nice thing about this is that the, the challenge with the two uncle, with uh, treating one uncle and two uncles as being separate things is that you can't, you can't extract that information from the block header because in the block header, you just get the hash of the uncles. But from the block header, you definitely can tell the difference between one header and zero headers because zero headers just, uh, would be represented as the as the hash of the ROP empty list, and so that's something you can trivially check in the block header. So, the idea with one B would basically be that you know you would kind of you would be the block difficulty targeting rule would target a variable which is basically the yeah, one kind of unit per thirteen seconds, where the unit is one one per block and two per block that contains either one or two uncles. I mean, personally, this seems reasonably uncontroversial. It's, a, it's an obvious fix and it improves things. Does anyone have any objections to it being a metropolis fix? Um, strong preference towards the version which simply relies on the block headers. I think difficult calculations mm -hmm. relying on block bodies is a pretty strong change. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all opposed to one B. Passed by 
Yeah, when I need a gavel. Yep. Ding. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, oh, and we we didn't actually make a, an actual decision on on ninety six. Um, I mean, it sounds as though it's it sounds as though the decision is that people want me to uh, kind of write up the uh, bas basically re uh, write up the version that ha that kind of go goes back further in history with uh, de with decreasing frequencies and write up the EIP for the uh, like line algorithm and uh, then uh, discuss it again next time around. Okay, you happy to do that? Yep. All right, cool. Um, in that case, the next one is 196 and 197 pairings. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a missing, actually, no, never mind. I, I, I thought 101 was missing, but then I, real, I remembered that 101 was superseded by 198, so all good. Um, yeah, pairings. Um, Christian, you around? So we already talked about that in the very beginning mm -hmm. yes so something else <laughs> so um, yeah v wasn't there but i i guess the consensus was yes these all seem okay wasn't it i think so yeah okay um, um, uh, I am I am happy to provide a number number theory tech support to anyone trying to implement this and uh, having problems understanding how it works. Suspect that will be appreciated. Uh, Vitalik, there, there were, was a question about the expected uh, resource consumption. I guess for the pairing, mm -hmm. it should be linear in the number of yeah pairings. Yeah, like I think the get the resource consumption should be. Um, a pl a plus uh, b times n, where a is a is a constant, and, or and the are, are constants, and n is the uh, number of uh, arguments that get multiplied up. Does it make any sense to limit the number of pairings, or not really? Um, I'd say no. I mean, I, at least I don't see any reason why. It's all just time, right? It's not that some of the yeah. need a lot of memory or something like that. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. Good. And the yeah, the, the elliptic curve scalar multiplication that is similar to EXP, right? Um what do you mean similar to EXP? The 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 gas costs will probably oh, be well, the, the gas much. cost for elliptic curve stuff should just be constants because we're sticking to one curve. No, uh, scalar multiplication. Oh, sorry, scalar multiplication. Um, no, that should also be a constant. Actually, oh, I see. Because what, what, what? Um, so my opinion is that I don't really see many use cases in practice for scalars where the expected absolute value of the absolute value of the scalar is less, much less than two to the two fifty three. So, I just say make it a constant that's dependent on the maximum. Hmm. Okay. Like, what? Like, what's the last time that anyone's ever multiplied an elliptic curve points by four hundred and seventy-nine? Right. Like, it's always a random two fifty-six bit number. Ah, I see. Yeah. I mean, mm. yeah. Mm, okay. Inversion squaring that might be useful and could be cheaper. Um. But yeah, it's mm. probably dominated by the cost for the call anyway. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, speaking of costs for calls, can I just make a quick poll on the level of support for an EIP that would reduce the cost of calls in this specific case that the destination is a pre-compile from 700 back down to 40? I think that would be excellent. Um, that, that cost increase has caused significant problems, I think, for that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think I would support that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so 198, uh, begin mod X. 
Yes. Um, so the uh, goal here is fairly simple. It's just modular exponentiation of big numbers. Um, and uh, so basically, in the data would be an encoding of three numbers. Well, the encoding would be like very similar to uh, uh, to the yeah, ABI, where you just have three likes followed by the three actual values. And uh, although it would be kind of less strict, it would just expect a length followed, followed by the uh, concatenated byte arrays. And it would return the base to the power of exponent module of the modulus. Um, the uh, only kind of, it, there's a, a couple of edge cases. So one of those edge cases is uh, what do you do if the modulus is zero? And my opinion is to throw. Um, the second edge case is uh, like how do you actually figure out the gas costs? And we spent a bit of time arguing. And since last time, the formula was slightly updated. So that basically it's uh, the floor of the max of max of the length of the modulus and the length of the base or well basically the take the maximum of the length of the modulus and the length of the base square that and multiply that by the length of the exponent with a minimum of one it's uh it is slightly more complex than it was before but this uh, removes kind of two uh two risks where one is situations where the base is much larger than the modulus and the second is a situation where the exponent is zero um, so situations where the exponent is zero basically are going to return one in all cases except those cases where the modulus is, is zero, in which case it throws. Um, yeah, I mean, that's basically all there is to it. The rationale is to support um, both RSA and, in general, any kind of big number cryptography. Uh, what about Alex's comment on the to the effect that uh, thirty two bits ought to be enough for anyone? To the effect that what? Uh, that the length fields don't need to be thirty two bytes each. Um, hold on. Or oh, like thirty two bits. Um, I'm in I'm inclined to say making the length field thirty two bytes instead of thirty two bits, basically because like that's the way that the existing ABI works and. Uh, there's no reason not to stick to that. And I would even argue making it 32 bits would be more annoying because like, it's actually more difficult to construct 32 bits in EVM than it is to construct 32. Or it's more complex to pack 32 bits than it is to pack 32 bytes. True. So you know, I'm, I'm inclined to kind of stick to ABI style. I intend to change that, but it probably won't be in time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, well, any objections? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I guess move to, to make that a part of Metropolis as well then. I mean, it's it seems like an obvious um, synergy with uh, custom signature algorithms. Mm hmm. Okay, uh, in which case that brings us to 206, the revert opcode, and 207, encoding a revert opcode. Yes. So this is basically the a uh, kind of updated version of uh, EIP 140, whereas I understand the main change is that instead of the uh, revert Instead of like it providing an error code as a stack argument, it would it would provide error information encoded in bytes that would be returned in the same way that the that, that call data or that regular return output would be returned. That's more or less the idea, although there's some disagreement in the over whether or not call should return uh, this in the the return data area if the call fails, or whether it should be punted for a future opcode. I'm personally firmly is the opinion that it should return it. Wait, hold on. So can you just repeat that? So there's, there's some discussion in the EAP whether or not um, the call op code should return um, the, the value from revert if the call fails or whether that should be 
Well, it could, could well, if so, uh, you mean you mean the the value that gets pushed onto the stack if the revert fails? Yes. Well, the the memory area is specified by the values on the stack. Um. Hold on. What do you mean the memory is specified by the values on the stack? So, as I understand, one night at two oh six, uh, the idea is mm -hmm. that the revert opcode would have the same um, oh, semantics as the return opcode. Yes. Um, right. Um, is there so? What's the alternative to that? Well, so so the discussion is whether the call op code should um, populate memory with the, the data returned by revert, or whether it should be punted to some future op code for accessing. Revert. Oh, I see. Um, uh, okay. And my the, instinct is to word. Yeah. My instinct is to word call me. It is to word making call do it directly. My arguments are that number one, it provides a nice symmetry pair uh, to uh, between uh, return and revert, and the uh, the other arguments would be that it avoids introducing new opcodes, and particularly it avoids introducing kind of new for new forms of uh, t of temporary state. I'm, but that's just my I'm, instinct. Yeah, personally, I'm inclined to agree. Um, I mean, the the problem raised is that call doesn't provide a good way to, to access the length of the return data, but at least in my mind, that's orthogonal to whether it returns from revert as well. So it's a problem we already yeah. have and we already need to fix. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we add uh, return data size, mm -hmm. um, that's that's mm -hmm. a good pair to, to add, right? So, yes. So re return data size and return data copy in that case would also work on the revert result. Right. Yeah, so like the, uh, I guess th those would also be uh, opcodes that end up kind of introducing a weird new kind of state of, uh, in, uh, of, uh, of runtime state. Um, hmm. So are you saying that the thing that you have to basically keep the return data alive until the next call, is that what you're saying? Basically, yeah. So can anyone think of a, a problem with gas here? I mean, the, the memory was paid for by the callee. So um, I don't think uh, that's a problem, but are there any other complications? Um, OK, so basically what happens if uh, the call E returns like 50,000 bytes worth of, uh, hmm, worth of data, then that's basically a, basically a kind of second memory array in some sense. Um, but it's, it's hmm. memory that was already, it doesn't increase the-, it's, the it's, Right, it's, it's, it's memory that already gets paid for, already gets paid for inside the call E. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, it doesn't seem like there's data from that standpoint. But so what you have to do is you have to do another copy probably because you you won't keep the full memory area of the callee alive just the return part so you have to copy yeah. that somewhere. But you could I mean you could keep the full memory area of the callee alive. You could yeah. Um, but would everyone agree that that how we handle that is orthogonal with with whether call returns revert data? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I my own instinct is that the seat isn't like discussion isn't settled enough yet to, to say definitely include it as is in Metropolis. Um, okay. I don't know what other people think. Um, so we're that's... already using the opcode solidity or just about to use with the idea that uh, as long as it's an invalid opcode, it's it's unassigned, it will revert, so which is fine. And once it gets implemented, it doesn't waste any gas. That's fair enough. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, how about I will commit to like summarizing our discussion here on that EAP and see what consensus there. Is everyone happy with that? Okay. And then the other one was 207, which is how contracts should encode revert data. Yeah. Um, it, it lists uh, you as the facilitator, Vitalik. I don't know whether you had something you wanted to say on it. 
Um, let's see. I mean, I uh, already mentioned, already gave my comments, which is that I think uh, just for, for symmetry purposes, we should like just use ABI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it seems that seems a lot more relevant if we're definitely returning it from call as well, because it's even going into the same memory area. I mean, I, I believe the original proposal for Seaboard was when the expectation was that the main thing accessing this would be off-chain debugging tools, not necessarily right. anything on-chain. And I, I would argue that, uh, I mean, well, off-chain deb off debugging tools can, uh, don't necessarily even need revert, like anything that gets returned in the revert opcode because like the thing you could theoretically do is you could just push and pop a bunch of dummy variables, and that's yep. something. Yeah. Anyone else want to uh, comment? Okay. Um, and then the last item on the agenda is static call e one one six follow up. Uh, question facilitating. Are you still there, Christian? Yes. Um, I think not much changed on that. Um, yeah. There is a so there there's a pure call pull request. Is that? Yes. Same thing. Um, what not? What, uh, no. So the difference is that static calls can read state, but they can't write. Pure calls right. cannot read state, and they cannot write state. Yeah, I see. Yeah. What number is the pure call? All oh, right, one nine five, I think. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So for pure call, the main use cases are. I mean, well, for for static call, the use cases basically are that uh, any constant function where just you want to very easily provide an assurance that it's not going to do a re, uh, do a reentry attack on you and for uh, one the for pure call the use cases are I mean, one of them is just generally pure functional programming but the second one is uh, casper validation code um, it might also very be very useful for account abstraction yes So regarding static call, I think it's important to note that it won't do you any good against DAO attack type things where what you actually want to do is uh, send value to the recipient. Yeah, like it, it, it's not a magic fix to all kind to uh, all kinds of uh, a re reentry attacks. It's just a particular way that in some cases you can gain assurance that reentry attacks won't happen. Uh, what was that? Can you say that again? Can they can a static call send value? No. Or um, no. A, st uh, a static call can't send value. Uh, actually, hold on. Let me just reread how this works. Can't make any modifications to the state, but it can read from the state. I, yeah. I think it would be. Well, I think it would be problematic if static calls could send value because then you would have a way exactly. to bypass yeah, any. So what was what was the reasoning about it not being a protection against reentrance then? So, uh, no, basically, that look, there's going to be reentrancy attacks that involve uh, uh, state uh, calls that are not step that are meant to change state, but that are not meant to be reentrant. So, for instance, sending money to someone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there was a question whether pure call can make pure calls. Right, uh, Greg recommended that. I mean, I personally don't care either way. It's basically just flipping a bit. If you implement, if, if you restrict pure calls to not be able to make any. So one argument. Oh, sorry, yeah, pure calls don't go to addresses, they get code. Yeah, so that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, one, one rationale we suppose for making pure calls be able to make pure calls is that pure calls should be able to call precompiles and because yeah. precompiles are pure, so you might as well let them make other kinds of pure calls too. If that's, yeah. So, and pure call is subject to the same uh, stack depth, gas, 
6364 uh, thing as yes. a code, right? Yes. Yeah, so I have to admit I'm a bit behind uh, when creating pull requests from the issues. I hope I'll be able to catch up next week on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is there anything else? Oh, well, what do we want to conclude on the, the static and pure call front? Um, I mean, I'm... Hmm. Was, is there any real uh, um, specification on the pure? It's uh, 190, EIP 195. So I think both pure and static call are very useful and also quite easy to implement, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Static call seems offhand easier to implement than pure call because pure call requires taking code from the EVM. That's just my guess. But then, I mean, so does create. Easy enough. Sorry? It seems easy enough to me. I don't know yeah. if anyone else, any other implementer has an opinion. Do we want this to go into Metropolis? Please. Both of them? Please. Okay. All against? Have you got that gavel, Vitalik? Ding. Excellent. Okay. Uh, anything else? That's the end of the minutes. Uh, sorry, agenda. Yes, EIP 98. Again. So last time someone mentioned the problems with the white client, potential problems I'd like to hear. Um, oh, right. Yeah, so I think the issue that was brought up is that white clients seem to might be yeah, might have a need to exit to re-execute a transaction in the context in which it was originally executed. And for that reason, they actually need to have the uh, intermediate state root. So basically, like, so what that means is that removing intermediate state roots actually does have at least some cost. Um, so personally, I'm. Uh, by the way, can anyone still? Everyone still hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. So personally, I am a less uh, kind of. I mean, I'm less strong on, on EIP-98 than I was back when I first came up with it. My main reasoning being that I've realized that the bottleneck to with its scalability is not so much average case performance as it is worst case performance. And like even with uh, EIP-98, even with the IP-98, like you can still come up with uh, worst case, so like single a single transaction DOS attacks that would be able to would be just. Uh, uh, it's totally not parallelizable. So, um, yeah. Um, I mean, like, so I personally say it's. Uh, I'd even say it's much it's much lower priority than most other EIPs at this point. So if we had to chop it, I'd put it first on the chopping block right now. Mm, yeah, okay. Mm. But like that, I don't know, it's still worth there's there's still the benefit of increasing parallelizability. I'm I mean, I'd personally be happy to like keep the continuing the discussion offline. Okay, shall we do that then? Mm -hmm. uh, any others? 
I do have one. Um, uh, I wouldn't say agenda item, just something that we noticed uh, in the Go team. So uh, we saw that uh, Parity began working on the Light Client Protocol 2. And uh, actually, there is a Parity Light Protocol spec on their web page, which is kind of based on the last protocol, but a bit modified. And I just wanted to brought up, bring it up that perhaps uh, it would be best not to diverge the light client protocols, because then we'll have a separate parity island and a separate geth island in the network. So maybe it would be nice to start standardizing the light client protocol too through EAPS to ensure that uh, we don't get to non-conforming protocols and then one of the clients need to suck it up and give it up. Uh, yeah, so that... Wiki page is really strongly work in progress. Um, I'm in pretty regular communication with Jolt already. So I don't know, yeah. Uh, probably we can merge some of those changes back into LES. I'm not opposed to it, for sure. Uh, we can um, continue that discussion offline, though. Yeah, of course. So Jolt also said that uh, there are some really nice ideas that you guys are doing. So it's it definitely it would benefit both projects and the whole thing in uh, in general. I just wanted to make, wanted to be on the same page that we don't accidentally dream up two separate protocols and then fight it out between them. Rather, we should be aim for a more constructive approach. Uh, yes, I agree. Cool. I'm not sure whether you guys want to do it through EIPs or or more personally or more directly between the teams? I think um, I... So I think the, the thing I'd really like to see in an EIP is the V5 discovery protocol. And uh, I understand that Gets, like client, uses this already. And Arkady and I went over to the office and spoke with Felix about it uh, a mm -hmm. couple months ago. And it seems like a, a good proposal. I'd love to see it as an EIP start getting that standardized and implemented in parity as well. And that's definitely a big step towards light clients. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. I think uh, Felix definitely wanted to document the whole thing. But uh, I think the problem was that uh, it was always labeled experimental. So they didn't want to spend too much time on it. But since uh, it appears to work more or less nicely, I think, uh, yeah, we should really put in the effort to uh, catch up a nice uh, a proper EIP for it. So I'll, I'll try to talk with Felix. and. Uh, try to convince him or Jolt, or maybe we can also help him to, to gather the IP. Because it's um, it's really awesome that you can just start the discovery protocol and you immediately get peers. I think we should, it, would, it would be really helpful for the test net too. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Yeah, uh, I'd like to suggest that we consider saving, I mean, uh, separating these EAPs and these uh, changes into two separate, two or more hard forks uh, and not just one big metropolis hard fork. But I guess that's a later mm. question anyway. Um, I think uh, that's probably worth uh, seeing what our progress is at about a month from now. And uh, basically, yeah, seeing how realistic that is. So, Martin, are you concerned about deadlines, or are you concerned about technical risk from the fork? I'm I thinking about the technical risks and um, the fact that this has to be implemented. Like, some fork has to be implemented within the next uh, five months uh, to uh, push the ice age back. Yeah, that's one thing, and I'm also concerned about doing two large changes in one go and not having uh, sufficient uh, test material, for example, uh, to test how everything here uh, interacts uh, with everything else when we do all these changes. So I'd prefer doing separate, several small, smaller forks. But I guess we don't, so, that's not something we have to decide or, uh, right now. Just, uh, I, I guess it is probably, I, I mean, at least the, at this stage, it's it's feasible to 
start implementing basically everything and then see how it goes and uh, we'll get a feeling on what needs more testing and what can be done quicker. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, sounds good to me. Another thing that uh, we don't have to discuss now, but uh, it would be nice maybe to schedule it for the next um, meeting is uh, for basically for HD wallets, there's a EIP with derivation paths. It's fun. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, for the last few weeks, I was working with integrating the ledger into Geth and it kind of works awesomely. It will probably release it on Monday. And, but the ledger itself is an HD wallet. So you can actually derive arbitrary accounts and that is also supported in Geth. For now, um, I, if you read that EIP proposal page, I think there are two competing uh, derivation paths being discussed. The, basically the whole uh, debate is around adding an extra nesting, zero nesting at the end or not. The ledger uses uh, one path and certain wallets use an extra zero at the end. And uh, basically what I wanted to say is it would be nice to kind of arrive on an official path because as more and more wallets pop up and more and more clients started implementing HD functionality, it will re really screw with users if uh, we get uh, diverging the paths. So it would be nice to fix that sooner rather than later. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think plug and play HD wallets would be really amazing and having to re-implement their own you know, custom protocols just to interact with them is probably going to be significant overhead. Yeah, the only question would be here, like how how would this be displayed to the uh, dApps and how dApps will interact with it if there's like randomly new accounts added? Because That's currently, mm -hmm. kind of like use an account and reuse, you reuse the same one all the time. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, change this abstraction a bit. For example, in the way we did it in Geth, was that we introduced an extra layer of abstraction called wallets, and then you can have a wallet can contain arbitrary many accounts. And UI wise, what Mist could do is that uh, instead of just displaying plain flat accounts, you could also say that, hey, here's a ledger wallet and there are five accounts in it. So basically just another grouping. Hmm. Okay, so this is, this, yeah. So the important, actually most important uh, current uh, RPC endpoint is is underscore accounts <laughs> for almost almost all apps. This is the first one they use in order to like know you uh, in a way. Yeah, well, we can. So, so that not, doesn't necessarily need to care about uh, about wallets. I would say probably the Ethereum wallet. If you just use your funds, then you you probably want to know which accounts are grouped under which hardware dongle. I don't think apps should really care about. Wallet. But does, does Nano Ledger create each account uh, a new account after each transaction? No, no, no. So the no, you can no. just create as many as you want. Yeah, you you can create as many as you want. You can read them. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is yeah. so. The question was about uh, if the if the file, if Ethereum method, if we should make some kind of official decision about the derivation path, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so currently there are two competing specs and. As more and more wallets will appear, I'm guessing there will be more competing specs. Yeah. And the problem is that it's all right. I'm not sure what the Trezor uses or KeepKey, for example. Maybe Nick, you know. I know the I only work with the Ledger. And uh, and the Ledger is already supported, for example, by uh, my Ether wallet, too. You're asking. So you're asking what it uses for what exactly? Uh, so the derivation path, the base path. Right. Uh, if I remember correctly, it uses the one without the extra zero, but it's been a while, so I'm not 100% positive. Oh, then that would be nice, actually. Anyway, so it's uh, just maybe if you have time, just read that. I think the debate is mostly pick one out of the three. Mm -hmm. I did have something I wanted to bring up very briefly, which just to get a feel for the water. Um, what do people think 
of the possibility of a, um, a pre-compiled that allows you to validate uh, an Ethereum proof of work. The idea being that it would allow uh, easier cross-chain interaction in order to, to test that a, um, a submitted proof was valid. Uh, what parameters exactly are you envisioning? Like a full block header or a um, hash pow hash nonce? Yeah, exactly. Just the, the, the hashes and the nonce. And it would validate that it was uh, correct. So there is a paper that states if a smart contract blockchain can evaluate its own proof of work, there's a chance of a 37.5 attack or something like that. Really? I mean, actually, I, th I think to be to be fair, that's still true if uh, the smart contract, if there's another smart contract blockchain can, that can understand the first smart contract blockchain's proof of work. And I'd also add that if people really wanted to implement that it's, well, um, Lulu actually implemented ETH hash verification in Ethereum already, and apparently it only takes about 4.1 million gas. So. That's that's still an entire block, of course. True. Um, Which, yeah. mm. I mean, I, so I guess Ethereum is just barely powerful enough to run its own like client. Excellent. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, my my thought is just that as we see wider deployment of Ethereum, we may well see consortium chains wanting to interact with the main chain and yeah. so forth. And the easier we make that, the more it's going to, you know, be done. Yeah. So I actually st I think that this was something that was overlooked in the beginning for uh, for a precompile that is that should be added. But yeah, because hmm. it's an obvious thing. I mean, you want to yeah. be able to. Yeah. How much memory would that require? Sixty megs. Sixty. Yeah. And it should it should be a bit higher now. It should be around thirty megabytes or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, regardless, it's going to be pretty expensive in terms of gas costs. Yeah. Just yeah. hopefully less than the 4.1 million that it costs to do it natively. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, maybe this is a waste of time with us moving towards Casper when we'll need another solution anyway. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I mean, I can put together a really simple proposal or even just post an issue on the EAPS tracker just to get some discussion. Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about what uh, your favorability on deprecating the ETH underscore compile RPCs is. I think it's sort of unnecessarily solidifying the set of languages which we can use right now. And it puts, uh, it overburdens the responsibilities of the node. I'd prefer if we leave that to development tools. I mean, I'm, I'm inclined I agree to agree. It, 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 it could easily, like, it'd be fine for it to exist on a node specific basis, but it shouldn't be in the ETH namespace. So it, it kind of uh, also restricts the ability of uh, of adapt to use a specific version of a specific compiler. So I'm also inclined to to deprecate it. Mm -hmm. Yep, I seems, also, so yep, seems sensible. Yeah, Gath also anyway doesn't have a built-in compiler. It just calls source C whatever it's installed on your machine. So. If you don't have it installed, then it won't work anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'll probably draft up a quick little EIP for that. Cool. Good. All right, anything further? Great, mm -hmm. well, I guess we can call this to a close. Mm -hmm. right. Sounds good to me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Just one thing, sure. uh, the next meeting is in exactly two weeks, right? I believe so, but you have to yeah. ask her to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I think so the EIP 
agenda said that every first and third Friday of the month, and oh. today's was actually Atcon. basically next week is Atcon, and that's why it was. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure whether it will be in two weeks or three weeks. Okay, let's ask for uh, let's wait for Hudson to settle in. Okay. 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 Bye. 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 Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye. Really well.